very much. Uh, my name is Ed Bates. I'm an associate professor at Leicester Law School and a member of the Centre for European Law and Internationalisation there. Delighted to welcome you to this event. Um, I'm chairing today's event, which is being hosted by the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, where Lucy Moxon, Senior Research Fellow in the Rule of Law, is acting as joint convener today. As you know, our event marks the coincidence of the 70th anniversary of the opening for signature of the ECHR and the 20th anniversary of the entry into force of the Human Rights Act. At the end of the title for the event are the words, quote, a time for celebration, question mark, close quote. That aspect of the title will reflect one of the possible themes for today, which could be that the celebrations around these anniversaries should not eclipse concerns that arise about the future of these vital instruments. Before turning to our speakers, and as a tribute to Lord Bingham, I thought it might be useful very briefly to reflect on a lecture he gave back in 1993, published in Law Quarterly Review. It was entitled, the European Convention on Human Rights, Time to Incorporate. In this lecture, published in 1993, Lord Bingham provided a series of compelling arguments as to why the UK legal system was flawed when it came to the protection of human rights, or as he put it in an understated way, quote, not in a very satisfactory position, close quote. I won't go through the full details of his lecture, but it's interesting to look back on it and draw some parallels with contemporary times. So in his lecture, Lord Bingham proceeded to set out the vital role played by the ECHR with respect to UK law. As for the future potential model of protection of human rights in the UK, he referred to the convention as, quote, ready to hand and, if not providing an ideal solution, nonetheless offers a clear improvement on the present position, close quote. Lord Bingham proceeded to set out the various arguments that have been put forward by opponents of incorporation and identify their weaknesses. He made a compelling case for incorporation, rejecting the proposition that the judiciary uh, would be politicized by the Human Rights Act. Concluding his lecture, it's interesting to observe that Lord Bingham suggested that incorporation of the convention would help, quote, restore this country to its former place as an international standard bearer of liberty and justice. And it would enable the judges more effectively to honor their ancient and sacred undertakings to do right to all manner of people after the law and usages of this realm without fear or favor, affection or ill will. That end note to Lord Bingham's 1993 lecture reminds me of the comments he made a decade later in the A case, the famous Belmarsh detainees case. Then, as you recall, he rejected the proposition that judicial human rights decision making could be dismissed as undemocratic. As he memorably put it, quote, the function of independent judges charged to interpret and apply the law is universally recognized as a cardinal feature of the modern democratic state, a corner of the rule of law itself. The government is fully entitled to insist on the proper limits of judicial authority, but he is wrong to stigmatize judicial decision making as in some way undemocratic. With those thoughts in mind, I now turn to our program. Allow me to start by saying that we welcome your questions in the chat, the question and answer facility online. You can type them in there anytime, but we'll save up the questions until the end. We have a lot of attendees here today, over 200 or so, thank you. So it may be that I won't be able to get to all questions, I'm afraid, but we thank you in advance for them. Turning now to our speakers, we thank them in advance for being here today. We thank them too in that they have agreed to limit their contributions just to 10 minutes so that we can speed through with various thoughts, reflections, perspectives and angles. They all have incredibly impressive resumes. So my final apology for now at least is that I hope they will forgive me for being relatively brief in introducing them. Without further ado then, may I first introduce uh, Raza Hussein QC of Matrix Chambers. Raza specializes in public law with an emphasis on immigration and human rights. He was appointed Silk in 2012, 2010 and nominated in 2013 as Human Rights Silk of the Year. Having previously been awarded Human Rights and Public Law Junior of the Year by Chambers Bar Awards in 2007. 
In 2003, Raza was listed among the top 100 silks in any fields of law uh, in, at the UK bar. So Raza, if I may uh, hand over to you on your topic, thank you, your reflections as a practitioner on 20 years of the Human Rights Act. Uh, Ed, thank you very much uh, for your kind words of introduction. Thank you also to uh, Lucy Moxham, one of the research fellows at the BM Centre, for in inviting me to speak. Um, I think that the Human Rights Act has made a colossal contribution to the law and indeed to uh, public standards in the UK in the last 20 years. Uh, in my 10 minutes, I want to give three examples uh, and then I want to say something about the contribution of the HRA to the scourge of modern slavery. Appropriately enough, I'm going to refer liberally uh, to the great uh, Lord Bingham. Uh, my first example concerns the principle of equality. Uh, it uh, concerns a case you've already mentioned, perhaps the standout human rights case over the last 20 years, the Belmarsh case decided in 2004, uh, which concerned provisions of the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act 2001, enacted in the aftermath of the atrocity of 9-11, and which permitted the indefinite detention of suspected international terrorists whom the Secretary of State wished to deport, but could not do so compatibly with Article 3 of the Convention. The House of Lords held, of course, that these provisions were incompatible with Articles 5 and 14 of the Convention and quashed the derogation order, derogating from Article 5, holding that it was discriminatory to single out foreign nationals for detention when the threat posed was nationality neutral. Lord Bingham cited the words of Justice Jackson from the US Supreme Court 70 years ago, which Rabinder Singh QC, as he then was, and Murray Hunt, the present director of the Bingham Center, had pressed before him, uh, had pressed before the first instant tribunal. And this was on the vice of under inclusive discriminatory provisions. Justice Jackson had said uh, in a memorable passage that equality is not merely abstract justice. There is no more effective practical guarantee against arbitrary and unreasonable government than to require that the principles of law which officials would impose upon a minority must be imposed generally. Conversely, nothing opens the door to arbitrary action so effectively as to allow those officials to pick and choose only a few to whom they will apply legislation and thus to escape the political retribution that might be visited upon them if larger numbers were effective. Courts can take no better measure to assure that laws will be just than to require that laws be equal in operation. Forgive me for reading out a passage in such detail, but I think it is a, an absolutely critical uh, passage. Um, it made clear that the oft quoted phrase that all are entitled to the equal protection of the law does not simply mean that non-nationals as part of the everyone uh, have formal standing before domestic courts, although that, of course, believe it or not, has been important. You might have accidentally muted yourself. Sorry. Uh, I'll just pick up where I was. I was going to say that this, the, the quote, the quotation from Justice Jackson uh, meant far more than uh, non-nationals simply had standing before the domestic courts. Equal protection of the law doesn't just go to standing, although that of course has been very important when you, when you come to, when you consider uh, repressive regimes uh, where it, groups of society have not even had standing, Aboriginals in Australia, as I understand it. It meant far more than that. It meant that non-nationals were entitled to the protection of substantively equal law. And then in his sixth Sir David Williams lecture given in 2006, entitled The Rule of Law, a lecture which the journalist Martin Kettle in The Guardian described as, as the most important thing written on any topic by anyone anywhere that year, 
Lord Bingham considered that there was profound truth in those observations of Justice Jackson. He said that the principle that the law should be equal, substantively equal, was a pillar of the rule of law itself. I want to make two points about this. Firstly, this was a relatively early Human Rights Act case in a very pressing context where the courts were given, as you said, Ed, a perfectly democratic mandate, uh, not just as a matter of constitutional arrangements, but also the Human Rights Act, a double democratic mandate, if you like, to examine the compatibility of legislation with human rights. And secondly, Justice Jackson's words weren't simply profound and truthful, but also prescient. There was considerable parliamentary concern during the passage of the Prevention of Terrorism Act subsequently uh, on the subject of detention on executive warrant of own nationals. What followed, of course, uh, were control orders, which were nationality neutral, where again the convention articles scheduled by the Human Rights Act were important in setting, first of all, the limits of the curfew that could be imposed before it became a deprivation of liberty under Article 5, and under Article 6, requiring the gist of the obligation against the individual to be disclosed in open proceedings. So my second broad example concerns precision, transparency, and accessibility in the law. In his rule of law lecture, Lord Bingham stated that there is English authority to the effect that laws must be transparent and accessible. And he cited a couple of House of Lords cases uh, from the 70s and the 80s. Uh, the issue arose in another early Human Rights Act case, a case of ZL, where the Secretary of State had sought to certify appeals, uh, asi I'm sorry, asylum appeals on the basis of a law which bizarrely had received royal assent, but had not been published by the Queen's printer. So the certification had occurred in that hiatus between royal assent and publication of the Act. The, this demonstrated, if you like, the limits of the common law principle. The Court of Appeal said that there, because there was no convention right engaged in the certification, so no issue arose as to the validity of the exercise of executive power on the basis of an in inaccessible law. And the court just considered the issue on the basis of uh, common law fairness and said that because it itself could consider whether the certificate should have been issued, that unfairness was cured. Uh, by contrast, the requirement of transparency and accessibility is absolutely center stage in the conception of law under the convention. Of course, all the rights in the convention which are limited or qualified require an intrusion into those rights to be in accordance with a law, in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law as a necessary, although not sufficient condition for justification. As Lord Bingham said in Gillam in 2006, the stop and search case, the lawfulness requirement in the convention addresses supremely important features of the rule of law. The exercise of power by public officials as it affects members of the public must be governed by clear and public, publicly accessible rules of law. Now, I think what's very important about this, apart from the statement of principle itself, is that law in the convention scheme means law in its substantive and not simply its formal sense, as Lord Hope put it in the Purdy case. It means not simply acts of parliament or delegated legislation, law in the formal sense, but also to policies or executive rules which structure discretion. That's law in its substantive sense. So it must follow that anything which regulates discretion where a convention right is engaged must be published and made accessible. Now, the common law has also got to that point now. I mean, in Lumba, in the Supreme Court in 2011, Lord Dyson recognized and held that there was a duty to publish policy where it will inform decisions in respect of which an individual has a right to make representations. So this was a public law principle, it was, but it was surely inspired, uh, I would argue, by the human rights position. Lumba was obviously a detention case, although the, the very significant contribution um, 
of the academics, again, can't be understated. And of course, it was accepted by a council no less eminent than Michael Beloff in that case. But note that in that case, Lumber itself, the Court of Appeal had said that policy isn't law, so you didn't need to publish it. So it just shows you where we got to. And I, I would suggest that the human rights uh, background informed that very important development of the common law. We didn't have a principle before 2011 that policy had to have, policies had to be published. Now, the third point I want to raise just quickly is the duty, the third example, it's the duty to follow policy. If policy is part of the law under the convention scheme in the substantive sense, then it would support the idea that it needs to be followed, other things being equal. And that again, that certainly wasn't always the position. Uh, policy has traditionally was something that merely had to be considered by the decision maker as a matter of public law. That it was something that was relevant to the decision making exercise, not something that was indicative of what the decision would be, other things being equal. The first case to hold, as, as far as I'm aware, th that policies must be followed absent good reason not to do so, was again Lumba in 2000. And 11, and followed closely by a case called Kambadzi uh, a couple of months later. These were common law cases on the tort of false imprisonment uh, in the public law context. Uh, Lumba holding that there was no causation defense in the tort, Kambadzi holding that a failure to follow a detention review policy deprived detention of its lawful authority and completed the tort. But it's interesting to see how we get to that position that policies. Uh, must be followed absent good reason. Again, it's important not to understate the influence of the classic public law writers, uh, professors Craig, Waden Forsyth, Smith and Jarl, et cetera, and the insights of judges such as Sir Stephen Sedley. Um, but we get there from an Article 5 context uh, with, its, uh, with its law in the substantive sense, uh, baggage, if you like, baggage is the wrong word, but, but you, you, you understand what I mean. And the case I want to just discuss very briefly is Nadaraja. As Lady Hale said of Nadaraja in the Kambadzi case, Nadaraja was a case principally brought under Article 5 of the European Convention. The question, therefore, was, was whether the detention was lawful in the sense that it complied with convention standards of legality. Uh, it is not surprising that the court held that to, that to be lawful, a decision to detain had to comply not only with the statute, but also with published policy. Now, I'm not making a claim that we wouldn't have got there anyway as a matter of public law, but I think, I think it's clear we would have done. Uh, but it is certainly, uh, I think, important to note that the law requirement in the convention scheme helped us on our way uh, to get to this result that policies as a matter of good administration uh, and pu good public law standards must be followed absent a good reason. They, 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 they don't dictate the result, but they indicate the result. There's something more than simply a, a mere relevant consideration. And just, I'm sorry, I've gone over time, apologies. I'm very quickly going to talk about the impact of uh, the Human Rights Act on the scourge of modern slavery. Now, this is something which uh, successive governments have um, repeated their commitment to uh, meeting uh, the Prime Minister May and so forth have regularly said uh, what an evil this is, as, it, as indeed it is. And I just want to outline how Article 4 of the Convention, as scheduled under the Human Rights Act, has buttressed and strengthened the protection uh, for individuals against uh, modern slavery and uh, increased the duties on the state to prosecute and investigate uh, instances of modern slavery. Article 4, of course, has always uh, prohibited the substantive wrongs of slavery, servitude, and compulsory enforced labor. Uh, it was the, the prohibition against human trafficking, which is essentially a process wrong. It prohibits the process and bef before anterior to the substantive wrong. That has been read into Article 4. And the result has been very interesting and very important. So it was the Strasbourg court which said in the CN case that the UK had a duty to bespoke criminalize uh, the offense of human trafficking. 
it was only that bespoke criminalization which spoke to the specificity uh, and the gravity and the evil of the wrong. It wasn't enough to simply have piecemeal um, uh, criminal offenses, which added up to uh, something looking like uh, human trafficking, but you had to have a bespoke offense. That's, that, that was what was necessary. The Strasbourg court said that. The Strasbourg court developed the duty to investigate uh, arguable cases of human trafficking. In the MS Pakistan case, the Supreme Court held last year that a premature expulsion before the duty to investigate had been discharged uh, meant that a removal would be unlawful. Uh, Article 4 has read into um, the, the, uh, a duty to protect uh, victims of human trafficking by providing support in the immediate term. Uh, and those are all developments which I think on any view uh, uh, and any color of administration would welcome as uh, very good, very attractive. And I'm going to leave it there. Um, apologies, I've gone slightly over. Thank you very much indeed for um, that, Raza. Um, referring to various principles read into the Human Rights Act, uh, which have a radiating effect, I think, and the quality of law provisions remind me of the coronavirus regulations and the importance of the quality of law in that context. And, and you leave us with an example of the convention and human rights as a living instrument and how the Strasbourg can, court has infused a new dynamic in, in a, a vitally important field for um, Europe and wider than that today. Thank you very much, Raza. If I can now turn to um, uh, Nadia Amara from Liberty, thank you. Um, she's the policy and campaign officer at Liberty, where she started in July 2018. She works on protecting the Human Rights Act, leading uh, Liberty's response to Brexit and ensuring public authorities are held accountable for torture and ill treatment. Thanks very much for joining us today. Nadia, and um, your overall title is The Importance of the Human Rights Act for the UK and the Current Political Context. Over to you, Nadia. Thank you. Thank you um, for that introduction and um, thank you for the invitation to, to speak at what couldn't really be a, a timelier event to reflect on, on 20 years of the Human Rights Act. And Liberty as an organisation um, really has the HRA sewn into the fabric of, of who we are and everything we do from our legal cases to our policy work and our advice and information service. And so therefore we're, we're quite well placed to speak to both the impact um, of the HRA on the UK and the current political context that we find ourselves in. Um, so I'm going to divide my time by speaking to the HRA's um, past, present and future. First, I will speak briefly to the positive impacts the HRA has had on the UK over the past 20 years. Second, I will speak to the HRA today, um, touching on the various frontiers upon which the HRA is under threat. And finally, I, wa I want to touch on, on the Human Rights Act's future and, and importantly, how to respond to the government's recent proposals and, and future plans, which, which in our view um, seek to erode the human rights framework. So turning first to the past and, and the impact of, of the HRA on the UK to date. Um, headlines and, and public discourse on, on the HRA tends to focus on, on the big cases, the cases which if you were on one side show the value of the HRA and if you're on the other side show how it is um, ripe for abuse. However, I don't think that this is where the real impact of, of the HRA is found. Um, its real impact is how it has become entwined in the everyday of UK political life and in doing so ha has become part of our constitutional fabric. And I think it has succeeded in doing this in, in many respects through um, really the simplicity of the legislation. Um, the HRA doesn't, doesn't say awfully much on the face of it. Essentially, here is a list of rights. Public bodies must respect these rights in everything they do. And if they don't respect those rights, here is a remedy through the courts. And if the law is so broken and can't be fixed such that it respects rights, here is a way for the courts to, to tell this to lawmakers. And it's often said that the UK doesn't have a, a human rights culture. And in many ways, I think that is true. Um, however, what the HRA has created is a human rights legal culture in the UK. Um, and in doing so, um, public bodies, whenever they are exercising their functions, must turn their minds to the human rights implications of their decisions. And if they don't, any, personally, uh, any person adversely affected by that decision can challenge it in court. And the implications of that has really been profound. 
And the successes of the HRA are, are in this way really um, too many to list. No matter who you are, the HRA is supposed to protect you and give you a remedy if your rights are not respected. And this is not to um, suggest that the HRA is perfect or works all of the time. However, it's this simple and, and effective approach, which, which is really the HRA's success. And the reason it has been, um, in, in my view, the subject of, of sustained attack and opposition um, from some quarters over the past 20 years. So turning now to the, to the present and, and the current political context and, and what that means for the HRA. Um, so the 2019 general election saw, of course, the Conservative Party led by um, Boris Johnson secure an 80 seat parliamentary majority, which has really instantly um, shifted the political landscape um, beyond recognition. Um, but hidden away on page 48 of, of the Conservatives manifesto was a section containing a commitment to look at the broader aspects of the UK constitution after Brexit. And the pledges on, on page 48 span from looking at the relationship between the government, parliament and the courts to updating the Human Rights Act and, and to ensuring that judicial review is not abused to conduct politics by other means. And while vaguely drawn, taken together, these, these commitments constitute really the broadest constitutional reform agenda in living memory. And Liberty as an organization has, has been monitoring very closely the government's implementation of its, of its commitments made on, on page 48 since the election. And what we have come to realize is that, is that this agenda underpins not only the direct efforts to implement the manifesto commitments, but it's really apparent across a, a range of policy and legislative proposals. So turning first to what we might call the formal implementation of, of page 48 commitments, the government has already pushed forward with, with a really concerning independent review of administrative law, which taken at its highest ha has the potential to completely upend the judicial review process, which is, as we know, a key mechanism through, through which the rights protected by the HRA are brought to life. And before Christmas, we, we expect a similar review in, in, into the Human Rights Act this time. And while there has been a marked lack of transparency around, around the scope and, and the process for the review, our view is that the government is quite likely to target the enforcement mechanisms of, of the HRA through, through that review. Um, because what we've seen in the context of Brexit negotiations and, and based on statements this year from the Lord Chancellor, it does appear that for now, the UK um, remains certainly in, in, in name anyway, committed to the ECHR, but will commit only to the spirit of the, of the HRA, which opens it up, of course, to a range of regressive amendments. And while it's of course possible that, that the government might use this review for a kind of tanks on the lawn attack on the HRA again, perhaps seeking to, to repeal and replace it, our current view is, is that the long held government frustrations with certain ECHR rights and how they've been interpreted by the courts is being really dealt with outside of that formal review process and, and, and through separate pieces of legislation. And I'll just point to two key examples to demonstrate this, though I envisage over time we, we will see some more. So first of all, there's the Overseas Operations Bill, and, and secondly, the, the Home Secretary's much, much publicised, um, but as yet still forthcoming, Sovereign Borders Bill. So the Overseas Operations Bill um, seeks to prevent prosecutions of, of members of the armed forces um, in all but really the most exceptional circumstances after five years, while at the same time preventing civil claims, including HRA claims, um, from being brought against the MOD and um, the Ministry of Defence um, after six years. And, and this bill applies to all offences um, other than sexual offences, and that includes torture, that includes war crimes, um, and it even includes genocide. And, and the bill also introduces a, a duty on, on the Secretary of State to consider derogating um, from the ECHR in future conflicts, um, though it does not oblige, uh, oblige it to do so. And then the Sovereign Borders Bill, which is as yet to be published, so is really on, uh, yeah, based on speculation. But this comes off, off the back of mounting hostile and, and increasingly dangerous rhetoric from, from the Home Office, the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister about activists, do-gooder and, and lefty human rights and immigration lawyers. And it also arises in the context of leaked plans to offshore asylum and um, processing centres in, in places as obscure as Ascension Island. And really what it seems is that a key limb of the government's plans in this context is to legislate to tell the courts um, 
how to interpret the concept of ill treatment under Article 3 when considering the HRA in, in challenges to deportation um, or removal. And so really, as these examples show, the threat to the HRA and the rights it protects um, and the mechanisms through which those rights are protected are not only taking place through, through these formal review processes that, that are also ongoing. And really, this is different um, to past government's repeal and replace uh, approach, which, is, which has failed to go anywhere to date. And, and this new approach, um, certainly from, from a campaigning perspective, um, is much more challenging to counter. It, it feels increasingly like whack-a-mole. Um, but understanding and, and responding to the threat to the HRA wherever it arises really will be, be vital to, to protecting it in the long run. And so for my final few minutes, um, I want to briefly think about the, the at least the near future and, and specifically how human rights advocates and those who want to protect the HRA should respond to this new and really multi-handed approach by the government. So first of all, I think it's important that um, we recognise the political climate we find ourselves in and, and from that then assess who holds power and who holds influence in that context. And so, of course, the, the very large government majority in the Commons really means that the power held by opposition parties is significantly diminished. And essentially, it, it, it seems likely that once a bill gets to Parliament, there really is little to be done to stop it. Um, not, that, not that we shouldn't continue to try. Um, but if we just take the Overseas Operations Bill, for example, which is really a truly odious and, and poorly conceived bill, just sailed through, through the Commons completely unamended, which is really rather unprecedented. And what this means is, is that we really need to be engaging and, and, and mobilizing a broad, a broad um, sector of the public um, so that they um, put pressure on the government uh, in the hope that, that a bill seeking to damage the HRA never really reaches parliament. And time and again this year, what we have seen of, of the present government is, is a willingness to, to U-turn on, on policy positions following public outcry. And so we really need to leverage that and, and mobilize not only human rights advocates, but, but also those who are, who are somewhat skeptical or, or think that, that human rights have, have gone too far. Secondly, I think we really need to um, spell out key stakeholders, in, including parliamentarians and the public, um, the many limbs of the government's constitutional reform agenda, which, which at its core is, is, is really about the centralization of, of executive power, the removal of, of checks and balances on that power, and ultimately the dilution of a human rights framework, um, which applies and is accessible equally to everyone. And finally, I think we all really need to work together to not only respond to the threats on our doorstep, but also to really um, kind of hunker down for the long game. And we need to remain ambitious. However, I think the political reality suggests that the human rights framework is likely to sustain some damage in the months and years to come. And those who care about the HRA and, and the rights it protects and how it approaches protecting them um, need to really be working um, on a progressive vision, which, which has, the, has the potential to foster a culture of, of human rights in this country. And so just to wrap up, um, the title of this event uh, asks whether, whether it is time to celebrate. And I think there is much to celebrate. The Human Rights Act has, has in many respects altered the UK's constitutional fabric and in doing so has brought human rights to life by making them enforceable through the courts and weaving them through all public body decision making. However, ultimately celebration must not nurture complacency and the threat posed to the HRA in the current political climate is, is complicated and, and multifaceted. And the government is really successfully um, creating a culture war that, that situates human rights advocates as, as democracy's opponents. And protecting the HRA in this context will require energy, resource and, and really a lot of creativity and, and ultimately it will be about demonstrating um, to people in the UK that, that human rights matter no, no matter who you are. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nadia. Um, yes, really a time for celebration, question mark. No time for complacency. Um, it seems we've gone from the frontal attack on the Human Rights Act to what could be the start of almost death by a thousand cuts. And it's very interesting to hear you know, the difficulty of actually uh, responding to that change of approach raises very big questions. Thank you. Um, really, as, as a continuation of that, this gives me an opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Dimitrios Gionolopoulos, if you'll forgive my pronunciation. 
um, who is uh, holding the inaugural chair in law and is the head of Department of Law at Goldsmiths, University of London, where he's an associate, he's also an associate academic fellow of the Honourable Society of the Inner Temple and has been holding his uh, other event, his own events celebrating the uh, Human Rights Act just last week. And uh, we thank you for your efforts in that regard too. Very well received. Demetrius, I can hand over to you. Thank you. Sorry, your topic um, is the enduring threats to the Human Rights Act in the contemporary political context. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for your kind uh, invite. Uh, and the same applies uh, to the Bingham uh, Center and uh, Leicester uh, Law School uh, uh, to participate on this momentous uh, occasion when we celebrate 70 years uh, of the European Convention of Human Rights, human, uh, 20 years of the Human Rights uh, Act uh, with uh, the two anniversaries. Uh, um, actually coinciding uh, only one month be between, uh, between the two. So I will start where Nadia stopped. Uh, in August, uh, the European uh, Human Rights Law Review had as a leading article analysis that I was uh, privileged to undertake over the summer, uh, documenting the UK's refusal to commit to the ECHR as an essential element in any future partnership with the EU. The article titled uh, The Eurosceptic Right and Our Human Rights, the threat to the Human Rights Act and the European Convention of Human Rights is alive and well, deduced from the UK's approach to the ECHR in the negotiations on the future relationship that the Eurosceptic Right in the UK quite openly spied another chance to fulfill its long held ambition of getting rid, dare I say, of European human rights, having identified Strasbourg as the next target in the project to take back control. The article was taking as its point of departure that the Conservatives uh, policy on the Human Rights Act and the SHR has in recent years mutated from direct political aggression with a pledge to repeal uh, the Act in the 2015 manifesto to a strategy of creating ambiguity and chipping away at its democratic legitimacy with the 2017 and 2019 manifestos, points uh, that Nadia has reflected on as well. The opponents of human rights were feeling emboldened by Brexit, noted the article, quoting the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, his 2017 Eleanor Roosevelt lecture more specifically, where Sir Keir also warned there are those that want Britain to retreat further from the obligations of internationalism, including from the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights. Nadia's analysis pointed us to the new face of the threat that the HRA and SHR are confronted with, the government is now attacking individual aspects of the HRA and the convention, seeking to undermine key protections by stealth, so as to dilute the influence of Strasbourg, to quote Professor Colm Osinadi, who in our ECHR, ECHR symposium at Goldsmiths last week, that Ed uh, kindly referred to, also explained that he had more recently observed a slight change of tone in government's ECHR rhetoric. Coupled with recent legislative developments, most notably those relating to the Overseas Operations Bill, this suggested that attacks on the SHR might now take the form, I quote Colm again, of death by a thousand cuts, rather than a big bank repeal of the HRA ECHR exit. These latest developments must be seen as part of a linear political process, which started with David Cameron nearly 15 years ago and now continues apace under Boris Johnson. It is a contextual inquiry of conservative politics and European human rights that I would like to undertake in the short time that I have today. The thesis that I'd like to contribute to the debate is that the magnitude of the risk that the HRA and ECHR are facing in the UK post-Brexit, be that through frontal assault or by stealth, cannot be fully grasped absent an analysis of how deep a Eurosceptic anti-human rights, executive sovereignty-centered ideology now runs within the governing party. I will develop this thesis with brief reference to some of the Eurosceptic anti-human rights ideologues in the Conservative Party. My European Human Rights Law Review analysis was starting with Cameron and Theresa May, but let me focus on those currently invested with the power to harm the convention. So let, let us start at the top uh, with our prime minister, Boris Johnson's uh, nuanced approach to the SHR uh, and the HRA, which merits attention. Exactly a month before the EU referendum, Boris Johnson is reported as saying to a vote leave rally, not least, that we should keep the European Convention. It's a fine thing. We wrote it, get out of the EU. I'm quoting. 
I'm not against the convention or indeed the court because it's very important for us, he added, even if he asked to qualify his statements by noting that the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights do not have to be applied either by the UK courts or by the UK Parliament. In quite an oxymoronic way of saying the convention was very important to the UK, one might object. I don't think we can read much into Boris Johnson's statements on the ECHR, of course. If Brexit has proven anything, it is that the Prime Minister's strategic choices are mandated by political and personal opportunism, not ideology. My colleague at Goldsmiths, Will Davies, expresses this view with force, applying the logic to Johnson's wider political career and not just Brexit. Johnson, I quote, has no ideology and no philosophy and seems devoid of a single enduring belief, he notes at the London Review of Books. So if take back control driven conservative politics have very appeal in store for the HRA, Johnson's supposedly positive and in any case fairly unenthusiastic and ill-informed personal view of the European Court of Human Rights will certainly not get in the way. Which makes it vital, I think, uh, to look at the uh, idiosyncratic views that those close to the prime minister have on the convention. The views of his closest political advisor, first of all, Dominic Cummings, or those of the Foreign Secretary and Acting Prime Minister for a while, Dominic Raab, and those of the newly appointed Attorney General Suella Braverman. Let us quickly refer to Dominic Cummings then, who in March 2018 wrote in his personal blog that those on the Leave side will be starting our campaign for a second referendum on the ECHR. In Cummings' mind, Brexit and leaving the European Court of Human Rights went hand in hand the one following from the other, the two in a unison signifying ultimate Brexiteer victory over a crumbling pro-European side. We're leaving the EU next March, then we'll be coming for the ECHR referendum and we will win that by more than 50 to 48, Cummings declared. So if the number 10 technocrats are coming for our human rights, how far will they go, one might ask. Another blog provides the answer. To repeal the Human Rights Act and replace it with its own new version will not be enough, Cummings proclaimed, as then the current situation will be simply tweaked. The court may or may not make some small changes to how they interpret the ECHR, but the fundamentals would be completely unaffected. Provided we're still committed under international law to the Strasbourg Court, then we will continue to suffer from the often abysmal judgments made there. The Supreme Court will not be supreme. Enter the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Grab, one of the convention's most vociferous critics, well known amongst human rights scholars and activists for his efforts over many years to bring to fruition the repeal of the Human Rights Act. His 2009 book on the assault on liberty is mischievously, I argue, presented as a defense of individual rights, when in reality, it is the protection of individual rights under the Human Rights Act and the ECHR that the book is absolutely intent on assaulting. The book takes issue with rights contagion, for instance, the rights, the risks of rights and constitutional reform, including a bill of rights. And instead of legal analysis, we are treated to a Eurosceptic critique that stresses British exceptionalism and fits into a populist narrative that opposes human rights driven judicial activism. It then proceeds to give short strift to positive duties to act to protect the right to life in particular, Article 2 of the European Convention, be that in relation to duties that might apply to the police, the military, the NHS. On the NHS more specifically, Rab expresses concern about the idea of patients rights and deploying the language of human rights as an answer to tough questions about priorities in healthcare. How timely a reminder this is then, of Rab's human rights free philosophy on the matter when we are confronted with unprecedented loss of life in the UK as a result of COVID. Still, the true extent of Rab's assault on the Human Rights Act and the SHR is not fully revealed until he, discussing, until he discusses putting things first, uh, putting things right, entering the next chapter of British liberty with the creation of a British Bill of Rights that would entrench our fundamental liberties, establishing an autonomous regime of British human rights law. Conceptualizing a dividing wall to insulate British law from its European counterparts, somehow empowering and liberating Britain in the process was Rab's key proposition here. A Bill of Rights, I quote, would by definition root our conception of rights in British law and restore a sense of national ownership rather than unnecessarily importing wholesale the Strasbourg model, he argued. 
We could say that Arabis opposed convention rights as supra-political norms and concerned about their impact on sovereignty and the separation of powers. Two sources of criticism that are often leveled at the court, as the new president of the European Court of Human Rights, Judge Robert Spano, has observed. Such criticism of the court has achieved new prominence since the Brexiteer conservative government under Boris Johnson has come to power, with the prorogation case and the Miller case before that sparking an angry multi-level attack from the part of the conservatives that now conflates long-standing threats to European human rights with threats to judicial independence and the rule of law with the ultimate aim of taking back control, not just from Brussels, but also from Strasbourg and from the Supreme Court and the UK judiciary more broadly to bestow it solely on the executive. The appointment of Suella Braverman, a former chair of the European Research Group, a junior minister at the former Department for Exiting the EU, and an MP with a consistent record of voting against laws to promote human rights, as the new Attorney General in Boris Johnson's government has brought these issues into the spotlight. A few weeks prior to her appointment, Braverman wrote an article for the Conservative Home website in which she argued that, I quote, judicial review has exploded since the 1960s so that even the most intricate relations between the state and individual can be questioned by judges. Entirely predictably, the culprit for this encroachment is identified as the Human Rights Act and the prolific human rights industry which it has spawned, by means of which the concept of fundamental human rights has been stretched beyond recognition. She concluded, and I will be shortly concluding myself. She concluded, I am pleased that the government has promised to update the Human Rights Act to restore the proper balance between the rights of individuals, national security, and effective government, and to set up a constitutional democracy and rights commission to ensure that the boundaries of judicial review are appropriately drawn. These views bring to light all too clearly, I argue, the anti-human rights narrative of conservative, hardcore Eurosceptics, who now find themselves at the center of government with a unique opportunity to finish off those old enemies of theirs, the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights. Let me conclude by looking at the international dimension and bringing into the debate Lord Bingham, uh, both resulting to a fitting finale, I hope, considering that this event is uh, hosted by the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law in collaboration with leading international law experts at Leicester Law School. So Lord Bingham, if we, if we assume that he was right, as I'm sure everyone here will do, when he wrote in 1993 that incorporation of the ECHR into UK law would restore this country to its former place as an international standard bearer of liberty and justice, then we are entitled to deduce from the reverse the continued threat to repeal the Human Rights Act and now the refusal to commit to continued membership of the ECHR we can deduce from all this that the UK is flirting with a return to that prior state of relative isolation vis-a-vis -vis its domestic regime for the protection of international human rights, at least within the community of the countries that together form the Council of Europe. The former Attorney General, Dominic Grieve, has put it more directly, at the time notably when he was still holding Attorney General office. UK withdrawal would make Britain a pariah state. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dimitrios. And uh, the dark political clouds on the horizon for the Human Rights Act, you've made that uh, point very graphically there. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering when we, when we come to questions and answers in a little bit, the, the question might be raised, what can be done to address those dark clouds? whether the COVID-19 crisis will lead to a slightly different political climate, which may be in favour more of the Human Rights Act. Perhaps we can return to that in a short while, but thank you very much. Now, our, our last three speakers um, bring us to the focus on the European Convention on Human Rights itself, its 70th birthday. So in a moment, we'll be hearing from uh, Bashak Charlie, uh, referring to how all this is seen from the continental perspective, if you like, from a European perspective. And uh, we'll also be hearing at the end from um, John Dolhelsain from the European Stability Initiative, uh, an angle in terms of how the European Convention itself is facing very testing times at the moment. 
Before that, however, may I uh, come to Professor Meris Amos, who is an expert on both the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights. She is a professor of human rights law at Queen Mary University and is uh, well known, I'm sure to you, for her many, many publications, including the Oxford Heart edition, her book on human rights law. And I think a new edition of that will be very welcome and coming out in a very timely time into 2021, I believe, uh, Marys. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, your paper today is why the UK still needs the ECHR and the lasting value of the European Court of Human Rights to the UK. So we start to look at the European perspective. Thank right. you, Mary. And over right. to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Ed, and, and thanks, Lucy, as well, for organising and for inviting me. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation to make things a little um, go a little swifter. So I'm going to try and share my screen. And uh, the trick is to also look at the notes for myself. <laughs> okay. Great. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about the, the continuing value of the European Court of Human Rights to the UK. And I actually started working on this um, many, many years ago because of a conversation with a neighbour um, who we walked the dogs together and, and he said to me, what's the point of the European Court of Human Rights? Uh, why, can't we, why can't we do this for ourselves? And so I started thinking, oh my goodness, he's got a point. We, we really do need to make the case uh, for, the, for the European Court's role because we do have this much more effective protection for human rights through law than we, we had previously. And his perspective was the Human Rights Act had made the European Court of Human Rights redundant. And uh, so I was thinking, oh, okay, okay. It's very important to make the case for the European Court of Human Rights in the UK. So when I started looking into this question of value, um, I realized that it was quite difficult because most of the discussion to date had centered on legitimacy, it had centered on impact, and nobody had tried to put, if you like, a monetary value on, on the European Court of Human Rights. That's, that's very difficult to quantify in, in, in pounds and pence what, what value it brings. So I, I came to the conclusion that you have to make the assumption that protecting human rights through law is a good thing. That, that has to be your, your assumption. And then to estimate value, it has to be the value added to that assumption from an extra layer of, of human rights protection. And so listening to Demetrius just talk, I thought, wow, perhaps that assumption has, um, has disappeared from our, our present government, but we'll come back to that later. So I, I, I thought that it was, it was easiest to think about value from uh, different levels and looking at the individual level, the global level, and then of course the national level where, where value seems to be the most, most serious and most important. So at the individual level, of course, European court operates its individual justice model, which I know is, is consistently under threat. Um, and as nowhere near as individual access as there used to be. So it's this direct way of accessing uh, justice at the European Court. Um, and that allows the individual, if we ignore questions of access to justice, it allows the individual to decide for themselves, independent of all the other pressures at the national level, the political and otherwise, whether or not they, they're going to make a claim, make an application to the European Court once they've exhausted domestic remedies. And of course, this still exists in the UK. Um, I, I checked the figures yesterday for 2019. There were 354 applications allocated to a judicial formation. There were uh, five judgments concerning the UK uh, arising from 12 applications. Interestingly, there were five violations found on the part of the UK, and I'll come back to that in a moment. 
And the, the picture of the individual experience is it is very much, you would say, marginalized groups that use the court. Those who might not get the fairest access to justice or the fairest treatment in the national context. So for example, prisoners, disabled people, those who are welfare recipients, foreign nationals, those caught up in the criminal justice and the family justice systems. Then we have the value the court brings at the global level. It, it continues to solve, help solve global problems as Raza Hussain was, was talking about earlier, modern slavery. It highlights problems which are arising in contracting states. It, it helps to set minimum standards. And the UK plays an enormous role in that at the moment. And it's not just being respondent to groundbreaking judgments, which is something that upsets not just this government, but successive governments. So our Skaney in 2011's example of that. But it allows UK courts to also make a contribution to groundbreaking judgments such as Jones uh, on state immunity in, in 2014. But it's at the national level, I think this, this value is, is most important. And clearly the convention system, the European Court of Human Rights is a disincentive to act in violation of the convention. That's a disincentive for government, for parliament, um, and hopefully for courts as well. The, the court will hold a state to account for its acts in violation, but we also have to remember the sometimes is neglected, the European court can help a state maintain the status quo in the, in the face of arguments for change. So this static value, keeping things the same, protection, keeping level playing field uh, is very important in the UK context. There is lots of evidence in parliamentary debates of this disincentive effect, particularly in the House of Lords. We have ECHR memoranda accompanying bills which are introduced to Parliament now. But as has already been mentioned by a few, what about the Overseas Operations Bill? I, I looked at the ECHR memoranda on that and I, I don't know how many of you had the chance to do that. And, and I was shocked at the, the level of analysis was, was quite poor. It, perhaps we could say that it was a political analysis of a very clear legal position that led that bill to be certified as compatible with the convention. And then we have the animal defenders example, um, the Communications Act, European Court found that the UK was not in breach. And so we, we have to ask ourselves as well, whether or not that will ever change. Most importantly, external supervision and an external court brings this pressure for change, this dynamic value, this external encouragement to our courts, to our parliament, to our government to, to change things. And that is built into the Human Rights Act in section two, the obligation to take into account, which has been mostly an obligation to follow. European Court has facilitated a process of change, progress, it has resulted in improvements to existing laws, policies and practices, new laws, policies and practices. It manages to achieve outcomes which the national political process cannot deliver. And it also keeps the UK up to date. And so various speakers have been talking about this risk of isolation. So Demetrius is talking about this, this risk of isolation should the UK cut itself off from this very important impetus for change. So when I wrote about this a few years ago, I, I started to say, well, the dynamic change is, is slowing down now. Our courts are handling the process of change. European court is, a, is an excellent backstop. Every now and then there's a judgment affecting another state that, that will be utilized in the national context. But the, the days of the Smith judgment, the Osman judgment, the Campbell and Cozen judgment, the Alskani judgment, they're gone. And I, how wrong I was. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to admit that I was wrong. So uh, just a quick survey um, of recent case law I've just listed there for your convenience. These are all essentially coming from judgments of our Supreme Court. 
And the European Court has, has reached the opposite conclusion. It has found violations of Article 8. It has held that our legal uh, process is insufficient to guarantee protection of rights. It has said creating extremism databases without any safeguards and retaining the data of 96 year old men is incompatible with Article 8. And the one that I'm personally am, am very interested in is JD in the UK about this, this test that's utilized in Article 14 cases. Time and time again, our courts have adopted a test for recipients of welfare benefits that is a lesser threshold. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easier test for government to satisfy than a usual test of proportionality. And in JD, uh, European Court has, has said that's not the right test to uh, utilize. And of course, there's judgments affecting other states which are, which are followed by UK courts. So we have the, the recent example of um, Article 3 and ill health in Papishvili and, and Belgium now, now being followed by our Supreme Court. So to conclude, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my time. Um, a, state committing, a state that's committed to protecting human rights through law, as, as I hope, despite some of the, the bad messages we're receiving, um, if we remain a state committed to protecting human rights through law, this value, this continuing value of the European Court of Human Rights to that objective is, is, is important. And we're seeing a real resurgence in, in important developments on, um, on UK case law. Um, as, as Ed mentioned, I'm writing, I'm finishing, I've almost finished third edition of, of my book, Human Rights Law. And it, it seems almost every time I, I write about uh, a particularly troublesome judgment, and I think th that doesn't seem right. Um, sure enough, the European Court of Human Rights has also um, received application from the claimants and, and sometimes decided in the opposite direction. But then we have to be careful and say, well, what about a state which is not so committed uh, to the protection of human rights through law? The, the value is not going to be as obvious to, to the present government. And so coming back to what was said earlier about it's really important to think about the value the European Court brings to the human rights project and to bring that to fruition and to get um, people to appreciate and understand. So uh, thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Is it gone? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Maris. Um, very powerful voice there. I think um, many of the points you were making initially was in an article you wrote in European Journal, the European Journal of International Law, wasn't it? Um, so I would certainly rec recommend that to anyone. And the points you're making, or you made so many points, um, valuable points, but also remind me of the importance of the Human Rights Act as a link to the Strasbourg Court with, with dialogue on that matter, um, uh, enabling UK law to also be infused into the Strasbourg jurisprudence or, or the courts to learn from each other. Thank you very much indeed. So we now turn to how some of these aspects may be viewed from um, Europe indeed. So. Um, May I introduce uh, Professor Basak Charlie from the Centre for Fundamental Rights in Berlin, the Hertie School in Berlin, where she is a chair and coordinator of the School Centre for Fundamental Rights. She is an expert on international law and institutions, international human rights law and policy. Um, she's also chair of the European Implementation Network and a fellow of the Human Rights Centre at the University of Essex. She's acted for the Council of Europe as an expert on the European Convention on Human Rights since 2002. I think the perfect person to bring us a view from um, the continent, if I can use that expression, on how aspects of what we're talking about today are seen there as we celebrate, and I assume on the continent also is celebrated the 70th anniversary of the entry of the signature of the convention. Over to you, Bashak, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you, Ed, and um, it's it's an, it's an absolute pleasure to to be part of this discussion uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to also thank Lucy and the Bingham Centre as well for the for the invitation. We may uh, just have to ask you to speak up a little bit, uh, Bashak, please. Yes, is that any better? That's good. I, thank you. 
Okay, I'll, I'll be a little bit closer as well. So uh, the issue that I was asked to reflect on uh, was how uh, the UK's commitment um, to the European Convention on Human Rights looks uh, from the outside and in particular uh, from, from the continent. But of course, um, bearing in mind that the continent uh, of the European Convention is, um, is a pan uh, European and a pan Asiatic continent, maybe we can also expand all the way to Russia and to the Caucasus as well in that reflection. In order to make this uh, assessment, I think we have to go back uh, a step, just a step back in order to understand how the UK is perceived uh, in other Council of Europe member states. And that step back uh, brings me to the proposition that the UK has always had a very important place in the European Convention system as a role model to all other members of the Council of Europe. So I'm starting you off on a very positive note and I'm doing it very much on purpose. So everyone knows that uh, UK has uh, drafted the convention. I, I'm not going to go back to the drafting uh, story and role uh, of, the, of the UK in that, but actually everything that has happened after 1966, uh, when the UK uh, accepted the compulsory uh, jurisdiction of the court. The UK was a model uh, for everyone else about what to do with this convention for a very wide range of reasons. The first one is, of course, the, the earliness, right? So the UK was the first country to test how this convention worked, what Maris has called, what the added value was, what was this external supervision was working, and uh, the cases, the earlier cases, the most important uh, classic cases uh, that has made the convention uh, did come from the UK. So we've learned about the, the, the court's role in interpreting the convention from the UK cases. So you didn't have to be British uh, to do that. So if you were studying the convention in Germany or in Latvia or in Turkey, you would be still reading the UK cases. So uh, the, the, the cases that were brought before the U, uh, against the UK has made uh, this, uh, this institution uh, a meaningful institution in its practice, which also meant uh, that the UK has served as a very important model uh, for uh, individuals and lawyers all around Council of Europe. The possibility to bring cases, the possibility to bring that external oversight into their jurisdictions is something that a lot of lawyers uh, in the Council of Euro Europe indeed learned uh, from the UK academics. Now, coming back to uh, the, the wide ranging role model role, uh, we have to also engage with uh, the, how the UK judges engaged with the convention. And of course, even before the uh, Human Rights Act was incorporated, the UK judges shown that they understood the convention, for example, in Smith and Grady, uh, famously, it was said that, well, we may not be able to find a violation, but we think that the Strasbourg court may find a violation uh, in, relation to this, uh, in relation to this measure. And when the Human Rights Act was incorporated, uh, Lord Bingham, Lord Hope, as highlighted by Raza Hussein and others in the Supreme, uh, House of Lords and then the Supreme Court, have systematically engaged and really did take the convention seriously. So they became role models for judges in other jurisdictions that this is something that as a judge, as a judicial decision maker, one had to take seriously. The UK's parliament's oversight of the implementation of human rights judgments through the parliament's joint committee is an outstanding experiment that has again been raised as a role model about how parliaments should get involved in the implementation of human rights judgments. But coming back to the compliance uh, with, the, with the judgments, the UK, I think, for the most part, uh, perhaps uh, only uh, up until 2005, and you know, going back to Hearsay, perhaps, and others, was also a role model. And what, is, what was that? Uh, the, uh, the research, uh, which was based on field work that I carried out back uh, when I was at UCL in the UK with uh, decision makers, have shown that the UK um, uh, members of parliament and executives saw themselves as fighting hard, you know, fighting the hard in, in, the, in terms of fighting their cases hard at the court when there was any adjudication at the European court, but then accepting the result if there were a violation from the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, this was explained uh, through a culture that 
UK uh, decision making and political culture was a rule bound culture. You would, if you accept rules, you will play by the rules. And even if you're not happy with it, and if you're complaining about it, you would actually stick to the consequences of those rules. And these were celebrated values, uh, both amongst conservative and labor and other uh, politicians in the UK. These are incredibly role modeling experiments in a way that the way we understand the convention and how it should work in domestic contexts, we have all learned uh, all of these things from how things worked out in the UK from 1966 onwards. And also we should add a very important note about the UK academics. The UK academics also did set an incredible example of studying the European Convention when no one, uh, you know, it was a sleepy text in the 70s. You didn't have a lot of articles or books. And now, of course, if you're listening to me and if you know that you've probably seen thousands of books about the convention, a key reason for this is because the researchers in the UK have taken this system very seriously and have analyzed it into, into greater length. So what we're seeing now, I think, has to be understood from this back this you know against this background so when the most crucial role model uh, in uh, in engaging with the convention system starts to change its way its ways and the way that it engages with the convention system this has really significant repercussions for everyone else who actually takes the uk as a role model it's so it's like you know if the uk can do this you know, you know, if if they do this, and of course, there's also a background assumption that UK is a rule of law democratic state. So we have to also maybe add that into the mix. So if the UK is disregarding the convention, it's bad mouthing the convention, it's trying to undermine the system. The, the question then is, you know, what, what, what reasons there are for anyone else, uh, anyone else not to do it. So it is incredibly significant. So we shouldn't sort of, we can say, well, what about, um, you know, Spain or what about Italy or, or what about Germany? But I think we do have to understand the historically very crucial role that the UK has played in the system. So when the UK started to undermine uh, the convention system, started to be skeptical about it, I think until about the mid twenties and so on, this was a bit like, you know, everyone could disagree with the court's judgments. It was actually not, a very dramatic setting uh, because there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with the court's judgments, engaging in judicial dialogue through court decisions, which the UK uh, Supreme Court has done on, on a number of occasions and so on. But as was highlighted uh, by the earlier uh, discussions as well, what we're seeing is not a sort of a criticism, constructive criticism, pushing back on the margins and here and there, but the UK has uh, started to sort of leave the idea of being a part of the convention system and uh, the, the value that it has uh, for the UK. And it has, uh, may, maybe speaking from outside of the UK right now, it has done so without any regard to its key leading role model role for everybody else. So there's, there's not been a clear appreciation of how important it is, what the actions that the UK takes domestically uh, for, for, for outside um, jurisdictions. So, so think about all the uh, sort of changes that have become in and around uh, Europe about the European Convention. Say in 2015, uh, the Russian uh, federal um, constitutional law was amended uh, so that the uh, Russian constitutional court can review uh, whether a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights is compatible uh, with the Russian constitution. Now you can say, well, you're overreaching, but I'm not so sure if this could have had happened if uh, you know the UK has led the Brighton Declaration so forcefully in 2012, has really pushed for a very deep uh, deferential uh, subsidiarity agenda. A lot of the UK judges have spoken incredibly uh, strongly and powerfully against uh, the convention, unlike Lord Bingham, unlike Lord Hope's uh, a lot more principled engagements uh, with the convention, it is really hard to understand if these uh, could have happened. So uh, the UK voices, which um, I think uh, are very much uh, infused by domestic political agendas, uh, I think have had uh, a, a much wider uh, repercussion uh, uh, in, in Europe. And it also has come at a very bad time 
so when uh, you have uh, the authoritarian and populist regimes uh, deepening their regimes all around the world, uh, UK has really left its role model role in a way and has basically joined the other side, uh, joined the crowd. So, uh, and I think uh, this has been a big loss, which means that for the continental uh, states, for example, like Germany, and France and others who are uh, still trying to sort of keep up or Belgium and, and what have you uh, to defend the convention, they have not only lost a very important ally and even a role model for them, I have to say. Uh, it's not that they've lost an ally, but actually the hands of those who uh, are completely in agreement of not taking the convention seriously has very much strengthened by, by UK um, switching sides. So the repercussions are, are, are wide, wide ranging, uh, but um, I think we should celebrate uh, what uh, the UK was capable of doing uh, for the convention. We should not undermine the long-standing engagement of the UK from 1966 onwards, not only by its judges, but also uh, by its parliament and its oversight and by its academics and by its human rights lawyers. Uh, but we also have to think very hard about what has made that switch in the UK, uh, this incredible sharp turn, and um, why it is so possible uh, for, for such powerful role models uh, not to think about the external consequences, some very wide ranging external consequences of their actions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Bashak. It's, it's a really powerful statement um, relating to the proud stance and effective stance the UK has adopted in the past with respect to the Convention and how that um, turning away has had a very negative influence on the Convention system overall. Um, it makes me think of the UK in a post-Brexit globalised world. Well, the UK politicians, I think, need to appreciate the stances that they have, have this impact on the convention in a very negative way. This isn't just an internal message. I wish you could get, you were able to convey those messages precisely to the politicians who would need to hear them. But thank you for what you said. Now, the, you, you were alluding to it there in your paper, thank you, that the convention itself has been going through a phase of reform over recent years. And this brings us to our last speaker. Um, never has the convention, I suggest, needed the UK support more than currently, um, which brings me to John uh, Dalhousen's paper. John is from the European Stability Initiative. He was a director of Amnesty International's Europe and Central Asia program and regional offices from 2012 to 2017. He joined Amnesty International in 2007 as a researcher, becoming deputy, de deputy director in 2010, covering the former Soviet Union. Between 2001 and 2006, he was special advisor to the first Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights. John, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. You're going to be enlightening us about the current state of the convention system um, in terms of the future of it, and the um, reform debate surrounding it and issues more generally about the um, troubled times that the convention I think is facing at the minute. Over to you, John, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ed, thank you, Lucy, thank you for the invitation. Um, and uh, hello to all of you, where, wherever you are. I'm, I'm also gonna try and share a screen. I haven't done this before. It's probably gonna go wrong, but we shall see. Yeah, I'm still there. Has, has something happened? Yes, we've got um, some quotations from the Secretary General. Yeah, very um, good. There you go. So to, to, to kick off with it, so pretty well every speaker so far has proceeded from the basis that the problem is in the UK, the challenges to the Human Rights Act here, but the convention itself is basically fine. The convention system is working. Um, and I want to try and persuade you over the next 10 minutes or so that this is very significantly not the case. Uh, and to invite you to think of the Human Rights Act's relationship with the convention a bit, a bit like a country that pegs its currency to a foreign currency. And what happens when that currency is wildly overinflated and at risk of a crash? 
And the question in these circumstances turns on one simple thing, it's belief. People believe in the currency, it's strong. If people believe in the currency, it's strong. But belief can't find a reality forever. And the reality of the convention system's health is very troubling indeed and should be extremely troubling for those who care about it. But let's go back a little bit. 2004, the problems with the court that everyone was talking about were pretty obvious. A burgeoning backlog that the court was struggling to deal with. Without fundamental reform, Lord Wolf said, the future for the court is bleak 15 years ago. Fast forward 10 years and you get the following conclusion after Protocol 14 and a decade long reform process known as the Interlochen process. Because of the reforms we undertook, the convention has put down deeper roots and the procedures of the court have been streamlined and become more efficient. This is the official story. Again, I'm similar quotes repeating the same thing. The prospects for the convention system's continued contribution to democratic and security and good governance in Europe based on the rule of law and respect for human rights remain very encouraging. All is well in the land of the convention. This is the view from Strasbourg and widely shared by many governments, most advocates uh, uh, across Europe. And it's based basically on two things, two graphs. One, the court has got much more efficient. Look, it's marvelous. We had 150,000 cases in 2010, applications pending. Look, it's 56,000. What's the problem? Show a politician a graph and they always say everything's fine. The next one. Implementation of judgments. Again, the number of pending j cases, that's the yellow one, has come down and down and down. The number of cases closed, formally implemented, is going up. So not only is the mechanics of the court working, but compliance is improving. The convention system is not just safe, it's good and getting better. So that's the narrative. I want to try and deconstruct this a little. Some of this will get a little bit technical. I'll try and do it both quickly and, and comprehensively. comprehensively. Um, so to start with the, the mechanics of the court, the, the backlog of it. Yes, it's come down, but what has come down? The only thing that's meaningfully come down is the number of cases that are always likely to be declared inadmissible in the first place. 88,000 of them pending at the end of 2010. There were 5,000 pending uh, at the end of this year, last year, uh, until 5,000 today. Uh, the number of likely admissible cases, however, I mean, it's gone up a bit, but let's say it's, it's the same, it, it fluctuates, but it's basically the same as it was in 2010. And this was the problem, not the other load of cases. So the overall backlog is the same as it was in 2004. The backlog of admissible cases uh, is higher, not significant. But there's still a stubborn backlog of around 22,000 non-repetitive cases pending before chambers, right? These are the cases that matter. These are the real cases, new cases, significant cases. And that includes 6,000 of them that are priority applications. That's articles two, three, five, one. The stuff that most ordinary people think about when they think about the convention and why it matters. There's 6,000 pending before a judicial instance that can clear 600 a year. It is still a decade to clear all the ones that are there at the moment. So what does this mean? It means that the court is painfully, pitifully slow to deliver key judgments on cases that matter. Half of all the significant priority judgments, significant in the court's own assessment, you know, the ones that it thinks really matter, interesting jurisprudence, significant issue, take over five years. And the non-priority ones, which may still actually be very important, you no know, gay propaganda laws in, in, in Russia, they take even longer. And I mean, here's the maths in case you, you don't believe me, but I don't really need to, to tell on. You know, it's interesting, 26% of cases, priority significant cases in 2018 were over eight years old, took over eight years. This is not a functioning system, right? And then you look at it qualitatively. And you look at, well, how has this convention system impacted on the big human rights stories of the last decade? The things we care about, the things we know about. And how's, how's it fared? Two of the three big policy innovations of the response to the migration crisis, 
There's been no judgment at all. The EU Turkey statement, four years old, first application over four years ago, no judgment. Italy's deals with Libya, right? Th this is one of the most egregious violations taking place in the EU right now. This is a policy in place since 2017, no judgment. Application still pending over two years. Spain's policies are in, in its enclaves in Morocco. Uh, it took over five years for a judgment on this. And as it happens, the judgment says, well, you know what, actually it's fine. It's just sending people back across the border immediately without access to any, any procedure. So it's either not delivered anything, it's been incredibly late, it's too slow to influence anything, or it's said it's fine. So that's the success on the migration question. On the increasingly ubiquitous practice of political prisoners, unlawful detentions and prosecutions across the, the Council of Europe space. This is really the kind of the litmus test of your system. This is what people think about the convention as being for. Can you have a political prisoner in the Council of Europe? Yes, is the answer. Yes, yes, and yes again. What happens with these? If you're lucky, you get a judgment within 13 to 18 months. This was the case of a number of, of people arrested post-coup in post-coup attempt in Turkey. This was the case of at least one of the well-known political leaders in, in, in Azerbaijan. But if you're unlucky, if you happen to be a Mr. Navalny, if you happen to be a Madame Ismailova, famous journalist in, in Azerbaijan, you're looking at a period of 56, 69 months. If you happen to be Magnus Sergei Magnitsky, you're waiting 10 years for a judgment, eight years of which you are dead. Okay, you're waiting eight years in purgatory for a judgment. Uh, this is not a system that is influencing significant political developments in real time with political significance. Extraordinary rendition. I don't need to go through the details of this stuff. Six years, three years, six years, seven years, impact, influence, zero. All those cases before are priority cases. They're the ones the court is privileging. But cases relating to freedom of expression, association, assembly, cases that matter to the ordinary democratic governance of a country, things we think that are really important to respect to it, human rights in, in the most kind of ordinary pedestrian sense, take way longer. In 2012, Russia adopted four pieces of legislation as part of a very significant crackdown. The power to block websites without a court order, banning of gay propaganda, foreign agents law targeting NGOs. I won't go into the details of all these if you don't know them, I don't have time. And legislation basically making existing <laughs> Uh, law and assemblies uh, even more restrictive. And how long have all these issues taken to reach uh, a, a judgment? The foreign agents law, 94 months and counting. The blocking of websites, 50 months. Banning of gay propaganda. And this was an issue that everyone knew about. 90 months for a judgment. The refusal to register an NGO, 108 months before the guy got a, a ruling on this. This is unfortunate because uh, Mr. Jafarov, whose uh, organization this was, was subsequently prosecuted and put in jail for three years because he had formally been continuing to run an unregistered uh, NGO. Okay, so there's the, the, the scale of the problem. The independence of the Polish judiciary. Probably the biggest threat within the EU, zero, nothing. Okay, so by court standards, it's only two years. Uh, so we can't criticize it too much relative to its norm. But in this time, the CJEU is pumping out judgments. This is the biggest threat to the rule of law and human rights in Europe, in the EU right now. And the court is absent. By the time it's pronounced any of this, this issue will either have been resolved by the EU or it won't have been resolved at all, in which case the EU is in deep trouble. But the Council of Europe and the court will have contributed nothing, nothing to this. So the court is basically failing to deliver timely, visible, influential judgments on the big rights issues of the day. If you look then at the implementation of judgments, this is the graph you get shown. 
the number of, of overall cases closed at the top one and the number of leading cases closed at the bottom line. Leading cases are the cases that raise the systemic issue or they're one-off cases of significance and all the other repetitive cases come behind. Ah, they're closed, more and more are being closed. Aren't we getting good? Yes, it's wonderful. Um, but what's the reality behind this misleading graph? Now, I'm not actually going to go into the details of all the rule changes and statistical tricks that have produced this result. They're myriad. I'm even going to take these results at face value and still show you what the problem is. Here's, here's an indication of it. In 1994, there were just three judgments that had ever been taken that had not been closed, that were not executed. That was 5% of the total. In 2019, 24% of cases taken any time up to five years from that date, any all cases over five years old, 24% of them in the history of the court were still open. 13% of all judgments ever taken up to 2009 were unexecuted in, in, at the end of 2019. Okay, so this is bad in general, and it gets worse when you look at specific countries. Azerbaijan, the number of judgments, uh, percentage of judgments, 10 years old pending closure at the end of last year, 77% of them. Russia, 60%. Ukraine, 50%. Moldova, 43%. Turkey doesn't do much better at 26%. This is a track record of systematic non-compliance. And then you look a little bit more detailed specifically, say Russia, it's closed 69 leading cases. Out of 291 that there have ever been, 39 of these involved no general measures whatsoever, because either it was a bit of a weird case with a one-off exception in a few somewhere, or it was closed because it was actually treated as a repetitive case. Someone got some compensation, they shifted the issue to another leading case, but nothing happened as a result. That leaves 30 cases ever against Russia that have, was, have triggered a change of which only 17, the changes come after the judgment was actually even issued, right? None of these, not a single one of these cases concerns anything related to freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, politically motivated arrests or prosecutions, and anything that ever happened in the North Caucasus. All the big things that have ever happened in Russia hitting rights, the court has influenced them zero other than the payment of compensation, which I don't want to knock. Many people I meet and talk with, that matters a lot. But structurally, any change of any significance on any of the stuff that anyone really cares about, no. Azerbaijan, it's even worse. The actual answer to how many structural changes have been triggered by a Council of Europe judgment, the answer is zero, zero. So on the big issues of the rights decade, the migration crisis, the authoritarian turns in Russia, Azerbaijan and Turkey, the capture of the Polish judiciary, the conflicts in Georgia and Ukraine, in brackets, there's not been a single judgment on any of them yet. Some of these have been pending for 12 years. Uh, Ukraine one's obviously a little bit less. The impact has been zero, not a little bit, zero. Russia, Azerbaijan, Turkey have indeed released a number of people at the end of protracted processes, but it hasn't stopped them arresting new ones. Yes, it reduces Mehmet Al uh, re releases Mehmet Altan. Osman Kavala is still in jail today, despite a court judgment. He gets released once his political career is massacred, like Ibrahim uh, Amado, and it's fine. He can be released because the objective has been achieved. He is a political non-entity, uh, and uh, you carry on arresting new ones, and your chilling effect has have been. John, I'm, these are incredibly important points, but I'm also just conscious of time. Yeah, um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap with, with this. There are two reasons for this. One is how courts operate, and the other is how states challenge the reluctance of other states to challenge serial offenders. Uh, and both of these things, I suggest, need to change. What's the link of all this? I'll, I'll, I'll skip a bit to, to the UK. Uh, when it comes to the UK's relationship with the uh, Convention and the Human Rights Act. It, it's pretty simple. Those who believe in the Convention say the UK needs to remain part of it because it provides meaningful protection against rights abuses 
and it is a signifier of your democratic respectability. And both of these things are untrue. So when under proper public scrutiny, this fact gets exposed, what do the ardent defenders of this system say? In short, if you care about this system, you are better off acknowledging these faults and arguing passionately for reform of the system rather than obscuring these problems because you fear that it might uh, give win to those that want to leave it altogether. That's it. Sorry if I whittled on for too long. Thank you so much, John. Um, presented with great passion and um, raising an issue that needs to be, I, I believe, on everyone's radar, that the convention system really is needing the support of states like the UK, um, is in a very fragile, troubled situation at the moment. I'm sure we'll want to come back to some of the points you raised um, in, in a moment. But um, this uh, now leads me to come into uh, a time for questions and answers. Now, I think in that regard that we may have lost Raza, into Raza Hussain QC, just um, he may have lost his internet connection. So we'll see if he joins us in a moment. But if I could kick us off with a question, and this may go, well, I have two questions. The first one goes to the domestic context and the Human Rights Act. Um, and this relates to uh, comments made by, for example, Lord Sumption in recent times as to whether we believe the Human Rights Act has overly politicised aspects of uh, adjudication in the UK. Could I put that as a question to some members of the panel who would want to answer that? And then in relation to John's last presentation, thank you, um, I wonder if, uh, if Bashak would wish to say anything in relation to as any particular aspects of it. And uh, if I could also put my own question to John in relation to it. Um, reflecting a question that was asked in the chat, to what extent do the problems that you are identifying, especially at the end of your presentation as regards non-implementation, to what extent do they come from the backlog issue or are they part of a bigger problem? Um, and more generally, what could be done to resolve this significant crisis that appears to be facing the convention system. So some issues that I'm raising in general, perhaps I could first of all put that question to the, the Human Rights Act kind of side of the panel, if, who anyone, if anyone would like to respond, plus of course add any other comment that would like to do so as a reflection on what they've heard today. Who would like to respond first on, on, on that sort of the political Lord Sumption line? Maris, do you want to I'd like to make a contribution about Lord Sumption because it's the same argument that's that's often deployed about politicization because it seems uniquely um, judicial review and human rights act review is seen as uh, a political context and Jonathan Sumption gives lots of judgments or had given lots of judgments in the private law context as well. And he doesn't see tax as political. He doesn't see contract as political. <laughs> so it's this, you know, all law is political and all law has implications for you know, equality and distribution of resources. And so it, it's this, and so it, it's, it's, it's a way of seeing it as seeing it uniquely, you know, it's only the Human Rights Act, which is political. It doesn't see anything else as political. So it's, it's, it's a mindset, I, I think. May, 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 may I just uh, quickly uh, follow up uh, to highlight a further uh, inconsistency, uh, even within the Human Rights uh, Act uh, context, uh, it, it seems in the context of uh, the pandemic, uh, more specifically, uh, that Lord Samson uh, is now enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastically defending a number of, of rights uh, uh, from a more uh, libertarian uh, point, point of view. So he has been challenging uh, with uh, intensity uh, the government's uh, measures uh, to combat uh, COVID-19 in the recent uh, months, uh, saying uh, that uh, you know, they, they, they are going too far. Uh, and not only that, he is challenging human rights experts for not doing enough to stop the government on its tracks, uh, which uh, I, you know, I, I think is completely paradoxical. On, on the one hand, uh, uh, the law should not interfere with politics. On the other, lawyers have not done enough to stop 
uh, government introducing further further measures. So I, I think it's it's a myopic, quite selective, with all with all the respect, the uh, view of, uh, of 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 human rights. Uh, um, I. I'd just like to contribute uh, that as, as a follow-up to what Mary has, has mentioned there. Thank you very much. And before I come to Bashak and John, can I just slip in a question as well relating to growing out of that point there, Demetrios and maybe Nadia would like to come in or Maris as well, or of course other members of the panel. Um, could the situation relating to the coronavirus and the way that may raise the value of human rights up into the public debate, could that be, um, curiously, even paradoxically, I don't know, a, a new part of a political climate which could lead to a greater appreciation, well, on the public side, let's say, towards human rights protection? How does one perceive that against the backdrop of the threats, death by a thousand cuts, etc., that um, was being mentioned um, by various of the panel members today? Oh, please, Nadia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the coronavirus pandemic offers a very um, useful and obviously unexpected um, lens through which we can we can talk about about human rights. And I think kind of reflecting on, on one of the, the questions in, in the chat as well and how we kind of engage the public on these issues. A huge issue is that there, there isn't this human rights culture or there isn't this resonance of human rights language or, or or it doesn't feel relevant to people's lives in a, in a general sense. And so a lot of work needs to be done to communicate those values and the relevance to people's lives. But what coronavirus has done is, is, is put, um, I mean, real civil liberties restrictions in a way that are just previously unheard of, but then also within the um, socioeconomic rights space, which is very interesting, just offers a, a number of different platforms through which we can now start to communicate the, the importance of human rights to, to people's lives in a way that feels um, that feels actually relevant to their life, as opposed to asking people to to care about the rights of, of others, which can often be um, more of, more of a jump. No, I I, th I think so as, as well. I think it's it's a really good opportunity to to not say what's wrong with the Human Rights Act, but to say that we could probably do better than the Human Rights Act. And this is a an illustration of how years of austerity have been allowed to kind of flourish without any proper redress through human rights law because it's not possible i i know that mary so you, you may you also developed that point uh, in one of your uh, uh, blog posts analyzing uh, the effect of uh, covid uh, uh, it's also a point that uh, jonathan uh, cooper the doughty uh, street uh, human rights expert uh, uh, has made in conversation that that, that we had uh, a few months ago. So oh, oh, these these expert uh, views highlighting uh, uh, how how COVID could could present an opportunity here uh, to underline uh, the importance of uh, Article uh, Two in in particular. You know the positive duty for the government to protect uh, uh, life, uh, be that uh, through making sure that uh, you know our NHS uh, staff uh, have. Uh, uh, the, the right um, PP in uh, place, um, potentially even triggering questions about uh, how quickly uh, we kicked off our, our first lockdown, you know, how quickly we came out of the second, when we decided, uh, uh, when we decided, uh, uh, you know, to, to come to, to launch uh, the, the latest uh, lockdown. Uh, the problem, uh, however, is that uh, it's, it's, it's particularly positive duties to act. It's, it's particularly Article 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights uh, uh, that receives uh, uh, criticism uh, from uh, the human rights critics in, in the UK. You know, if you, again, if you look at uh, Rab's scholarship on the point, it's, it's, it's the one point that he couldn't possibly bring himself to, to ever accepting that you know, we should uh, um, move in the direction of accepting uh, uh, these positive uh, duties uh, to, to, to act. Uh, and, and so that, that makes me quite pessimistic uh, uh, about uh, the, the, the government taking this opportunity um, to make uh, uh, the value, the, the impact uh, of the Human Rights Act uh, uh, more, more obvious, which again, and I'm finishing with that, you know, highlights uh, the importance of, of our activism, so to speak. And I mean, the point was, was raised uh, in, uh, in the chat, uh, uh, function uh, about about activism and, and you know what what we can do in that respect to further highlight uh, the, the point. Yes, the Human Rights Act is very important to us in that respect. 
Thank you very much indeed. Now, if I can turn to the, the Strasbourg picture, if I may, perhaps in just a second, I'll come to Bashak if she wants to make any comments in response to John's uh, uh, critique. Thank you. The, the comment I would make is referring back to the question I, I teed up a moment ago. And, but the comment also is that, um, John, in relation to the uh, issues are identifying, um, it appears to me that the majority relates to the lack of political support being given to the convention. It can only be as strong as its member states. So in relation to the backlog issues that I think you were referring to, which I, and I, I note myself, I think I'm correct in saying that the Interlaken report, the report, I should say, of the Steering Committee of Human Rights exon effectively exonerated the court for doing all that it could to improve its own situation yet remained woefully under-resourced by the states, for example. And I wondered if you'd like to respond to that as part of your you know, very very forthright critique of the court. But before doing so, um, Bashak, can I ask you to, um, if you want, if you would like to add some comments? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ed, and thanks, John, uh, for that discussion as well. I think it's, it's really worth thinking about um, two uh, distinct questions as we're talking about the 20th anniversary of the act and the 17th anniversary of the convention. One is, even if the UK uh, were uh, still a very important supporter, and as I outlined, a very important role model uh, for the convention, would we still be talking about all the problems and issues that John outlined? Uh, or is there something uh, that we can add to the analysis because the, the, the troubles of the court are very well known? by also looking at this decaying support uh, to the convention system. And I think there are two, two, two distinct issues. On the one hand, as we all know that uh, the convention had um, 36 state parties in 1997, and then uh, 47 state parties in 2007. So when we look at the numbers uh, of, of, the, of the cases in the backlog, the convention has exponentially, I mean, I don't know what the, you know, what, what the size, but it, the, the number of individual applications that have come to court have really, really transformed. And of course, this really ties into this incredibly optimistic moment in the, at the end of the 1990s uh, that, you know, everyone should become a member uh, and we're going to use the convention as a conveyor belt of values. And the convention is going to help, the court is going to help everyone along the way. But as you highlighted at the political will of all those parties was assumed, even though I don't know if it was there uh, right in the first place, as you, John, highlighted in, in many jurisdictions, uh, at, at, even at the very beginning. So the court was pushed into this role by its Western European founders. Uh, you know, the reason that the court has come here was that the Western European states have made the decision to expand the convention and to open it up uh, to all of this. And then uh, the convention, as you've shown uh, very clearly, is, is, really, is really collapsing uh, underneath that. On top of this, if you also remove the political support and the political pressure on those states that have been admitted to the convention by some of its core leaders, such as the United Kingdom, uh, you know, I think you're, you know, the the picture gets uh, even uh, a lot more, a lot more complicated. But I'm not saying that if the UK had stayed on its course uh, of of the 1990s, whether we would be having a different conversation. But I think this is the meaningful way to approach the issue. On implementation, though, I think we have the same problem. Uh, the states have to implement these judgments. Uh, you know, there's no other procedure in the Council of Europe for, for implementation. The Committee of Ministers is meeting four times a year and uh, a lot of paper is being shifted. But of course, the Committee of Ministers over time have become more demanding about how to implement judgments, thanks to civil society efforts. So all those cases that you've shown as closed, they were closed because they were not very much also subject to clear scrutiny. It wasn't the Western European states were doing a great job. You know, it was basically a case closed, uh, you know, goodbye and thanks. But now we want, we demand more from everyone for the cases to be closed. On top of that, we're dealing with uh, states that are resisting uh, implementation. The UK has added into this mix. The UK is also an incredibly slow complier and a resistant complier. So, you know, going back to this role model setting, 
uh, the the way that it has dealt with the Hearst and the MT and the and the pilot judgments on prison voting, the time that it it has taken the UK to comply with Goodwin. Uh, just a few examples. Uh, these are all kind of ranging over 10 years. And of course, you know, setting these examples was very crucial uh, for, for the expansion um, uh, sort of discussion. But um, I'm, in, I'm in broad agreement about, you know, being disappointed uh, with, with this court. Uh, but we also have to understand that uh, the UK and, and, and Western Europe has put this court in this, uh, in this position and then have also withdrawn significant support <laughs> from the court. Uh, and the Council of Europe is easily falling into a financial crisis this, the moment that Russia and Turkey modify their contributions. It's not even an institution that could function with the funds uh, from the rest of the states. So those are a few food for thought uh, for us, perhaps. Thank you, Bashak. John, would John, would you like to pick up on aspects of that as you see fit? Yeah, there's some drilling going on in the background, which I, I hope won't be too dis too distracting. I'll, I'll I'll try and focus on on both parts of your question. I think the the attitude of other states towards offending states and the problem with how the court is constructed uh, and incapable of clearing a backlog are both separately problematic uh, to, to deal with them in, in turn. It, everyone, you need to be realistic about compliance in the context of an international rights system, right? No one's going to invade to secure it. There are fantastically few levers uh, around. You know, how did things work essentially up until the mid 1990s? Compliance was the product of the collective mutual expectation of compliance. And it was that expectation of compliance, that mutual expectation that had everyone had of everyone else, that meant that the Council of Europe was a meaningful signifier of your democratic credential. And that's what you calculated when you considered ignoring a judgment. That is no longer at risk when you ignore a judgment. You can ignore an judgment without consequence. You can remain within an organization and you retain the moniker of a respectable country. So I think the, the of two things that need to happen. The first is that there needs to be a much more realistic conversation about the expulsion of members or the suspension of serially offending members. The integrity of the system turns on this. And if, because you are privileging the Council of Europe's geopolitical role, which is what everyone's doing at the moment, you take that off the table, you have very fundamentally undermined your system. And there needs to be quite a radical rethink about that. But then coming back to the, the court itself, right, with the current members states that it has, the current population that it covers, it cannot function in the way that it does. The court, if you speak to anyone with the court, they will all say they have taken every single trick, some more honest than others, some more desirable than others, to reduce its backlog, to reduce the number of applications and to expedite their processing. It has no more tricks in the box and it cannot deal with 14 applications a year. It cannot receive that many and deliver timely, visible judgments. If you want your judgment to be influential, it has to be timely, it has to be visible, and it has to create a political moment around it that people care about. The court can't deliver this at the moment. And then, this is the crux of the question. This is the real crux. It cannot be a court of last instance for 850 million people, right? It cannot be that and deliver the kind of system and visible judgments that it needs. Then the question comes, if the right of individual petition is sacrosanct and has been the thing that has triggered the most significant change, and this is all true, then how do you construct a system that enables you to maintain a right of individual petition whilst being able to prioritize the delivery of judgments with significance in a timely way. And I suspect the answer to that is somewhat paradoxically a two-tier system. 
and a return to one that's not wildly dissimilar to one that had a commission and a court. You have a first instance that deals with uh, repetitive cases, Weckle cases, you don't know what I mean, uh, uh, regular cases, and then a, a court proper, which like the Supreme Court, picks 150 cases that matter and delivers judgments on them within 12 months. And that privileging of big cases with significant structural and political impact over the provision of compensation to a bunch of people, for, to lots of people, but no structural change is a better bet for the protection of human rights. That's what I think. Thank you very much, John. I'm sure there could be lots of responses and additions to that. I am conscious of time, however, as we approach two o'clock. Um, so I, I fear I probably have to draw matters well, in a moment to a close, but there, there was a couple of points I want to mention from the chat. One was a comment, uh, I think, was, which was drawing attention to a paradox, what I would interpret as a paradox, that the the weakening position perhaps of the ECHR may give more latitude to countries like the UK to say that they can stay within the ECHR whilst amending the Human Rights Act. That seems to me a powerful point. And thank you for that comment in the chat. Razo, may I just ask, um, come to you, because one of the comments also made in the chat uh, may be coming from students, our audience and students, the next generation we might hope of human rights lawyers. I can't think of a better person to ask than yourself. Um, what advice might you give to <laughs> lawyers, uh, students inspired by what they're hearing today, or perhaps even alarmed by what they're hearing today, as to how they may go forward in terms of the legal profession, where they may campaign? Are you able to offer some words of wisdom from your own reflection on your own journey in that regard? Uh, I'm not sure I can offer words of wisdom. I, I can certainly offer words of of encouragement. Um, I think it's a fantastic job. Um, you can do very interesting things. Um, you can improve the lot of very vulnerable, disenfranchised groups. Um, we heard how, I think from uh, Meris, how the court has historically picked up upon groups of society that you know are disenfranchised, are unpopular. It, human rights law engages the, sort of the basic principle that that you know democracy is something more than statistical democracy, as as Dworkin would describe it. Um, you know, democracy is something more than just majoritarian rule. So it's a. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed what, what I've done. I've been very lucky. Um, obviously, it's prohibitively expensive to get into the law if you coming from an ordinary background that is a problem that's a structural problem but but words of encouragement really uh, i'm not sure words of wisdom and, and keep at it thank you very much indeed for that raza and that's in, an inspiring note on which to end we've seen today that uh, we we asked the question at the beginning a time for celebration question mark i think it genuinely is a time for celebration but we've seen very much now also that it's no time for complacency with respect to the future of these very vital instruments. We've been going for a couple of hours, so I fear, I think I do have to draw us to a close um, on a, a note, I fear, when there's many more questions to be asked. But I dare say we'll have the opportunities to try to answer them in the near future and in the distant future. So I think it just remains for me to say uh, thank you very much indeed for all of our participants today and for their contributions and the excellent points made and uh, thank you on behalf as well of the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. And I, uh, it remains for me to say um, that I think I draw um, today's session to a close and declare it as a success, albeit that it leaves many questions hanging over the future of these instruments. So thank you very much indeed to all concerned and good luck with the fight going forward. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Good afternoon to you.